Welcome to today's episode of the video review of the Roden & Swartz RTB 2000 series oscilloscope, the Sigland SDS 2000X Plus oscilloscope series, and the Keysight DSOX 1000 series of oscilloscopes. This video is part of a series of videos reviews on these free oscilloscopes. And each of the episodes talks about different sets of features of these devices. So if you're interested to see something about the other features, then please look at the opening episode or any of the other episodes that I've already posted or I'm planning to post. Today's episode is going to be about bus decoding. And we're going to talk both about serial bus decoding interfaces and about parallel bus decoding. Okay, here we have our setup for uh, today. And as you can see, the three devices are already decoding some COM messages. We're going to take a closer look, of course, at that in a, uh, in a second. Now, on discussion fora, I've repeatedly heard people that the Sigland SDS 2000X Plus series is a much better device at serial decode because it allows you to decode two bidirectional protocols at a single time. And that is totally true. At least it's totally true that it can decode two serial bidirectional protocols. The RTB can only do one bidirectional protocol or two unidirectional protocols. But does that really make the Sigland such a better device for this purpose? Now, today we're going to find out and we're going to look at that in, in great detail, of course. And you can see already a little bit of detail here in the in the copies of some pages of the background document where I added now some eight pages on the implementation of the serial decoders of all these devices. And in many different dimensions really you want to consider I think before you decide which device is, is better for a particular job or so. Um, today in the video we're going to touch upon some of these elements but certainly we're not going to talk about all these different elements here that will be impossible. Also today I'm going to do testing on one protocol only. Time will not allow us to look all of them. So I'm looking at the, the CON protocol which is implemented of course by all these free uh, devices. Um, I made that choice because I like the CON protocol. I've been using it quite a bit myself for a, a, a number of experiments and projects including controlling uh, model trains. Um, and I in the, in the past already wrote a little bit of code that, that uses it. So I also did that for, for today's purpose. So what is exactly then the setup that we're going to use here today? Um, I got two, uh, two count devices on the, on the bus. I got, I got a controller and a, and a peripheral. Um, and each of them are realized with a uh, Arduino MKR board and, and um, and an add-on a controller. So these controllers are fairly standard. They got a microchip MCP2515 uh, controller for the, for the signal side and an NXP uh, transceiver. Um, so that way these are real CON signals, uh, huh? so coded at the, at the appropriate level for the, for the CON bus. And I'm picking that up with a, um, with a differential probe and I'm sending the output of the differential probe to all the free devices that we see. Uh, today. Now, so what messages I'm going to send over here? Well, it's, it's a rather simple sequence that's going to be repeated a couple of times. And so um, each time we're going to send over the messages uh, that we see here on the screen. So first we send out a, um, a message uh, which has the, the, the short 11-bit identifier and it got a text string, an ASCII text string start. Um, then we got two more messages, short messages. Uh, with contest and uh, 500 kilobits per second. And we send out one more short message that is a message with a short ID of, of 11 bits, which says in text short and then followed by a, a number coded in, uh, in, in, in ASCII. And that number is going to increase in each step over the sequence. So this whole thing we're going to send over like nine times. So we get short 10, short 20, short 30, until 90 and then the whole thing starts again. Then after that we do the same thing, we send out such a, a string, but we do it with the, um, with the long address, so an extended uh, con package, so it's a 29-bit um, address. Um, we send then out a short message which got hexadecimal codes, from, from hexadecimal 10 to hexadecimal 17. 
And then finally, we're gonna do a, a RTR request to the, to the other chip on the, on the bus. So first I'm simply gonna send out the, the, the text RTR request, then the actual RTR request packet is being sent out. So that's a very short uh, one that doesn't have a payload. And then the other side upon reception of that RTR request sends out a, a message which is the text response and sends out the message um, end. So later in our analysis we should see that RTR request as something as, as a remote message. Uh, that's the terminology used in, in the Canvas that, that a remote message is being asked for. But the response and the end are regular messages because of course there can be many different senders on the Canvas and it's not like there's only one controller and a lot of peripherals and anyone can be a sender in its own, um, in its own, uh, in its own right. Now, I'm going to repeat the same pattern for, uh, for nine times and you can already see that happening here on the, on the oscilloscopes. Um, and what you will also see here that each time I send out this pattern, uh, I repeat it every second, I change the timing a little bit. So we can actually see also in the, in, in the trace itself um, the sequence going, uh, going on here. So in a moment we're going to do hands-on experience with each of these three devices. And I've already prepared the setup so we don't have to lose a lot of time going through each of the menus. Um, but before doing so, I want to share you something about the way that the, the, the decoder and the associated the serial trigger are being set up because it's quite different across the, uh, the devices. And so the, the, the thing is that some devices, and, 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 and I'm referring here specifically to, to, to the Roden and Swartz, they would present you in one single screen where you would actually get to see all the settings uh, that there are for both the serial decoder and for the um, uh, for the serial decoder and for the, for the associate trigger. So you see the different channels uh, and the input channels that are configured, you see their thresholds, you see whether they're active high, active low, there is a active threshold settings which finds the threshold for you the other settings, and are also all the trigger settings. So this is very convenient, you get to see them all together and you get to see the, the effect and you can make changes until things work as you, uh, you wish. That works rather different, for example, in the, the signaling. If I want to set up a signal, and, and this was a UART signal, huh? so, so here we had four different uh, input channels being used there. Then for the signaling, we need to look at no less than, let me count, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different menus to see all these settings. There's no way to see the settings at the same time. You have to go into these different sub menus, make a setting, go back to the main menu. And there's another couple of menus that you need to, uh, to get there. So you don't really get a, a real overview. Also a bit of an odd choice, I think, what I made in the Sigland is that you got the settings in terms of um, of the of the, the 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 signals that you 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 want to associate with a particular function and the threshold in the decoder, but also separately in the trigger module, and then there is a function that you can copy the information from the one to the other or from the other to the one, but I don't see at all why you want to have these settings differently. I don't see any use case why you would like to do that. I much prefer it the way that it's actually implemented in other devices that all the serial decoder settings are automatically brought over and used for, for, the, for, for the trigger setting. So it's a bit of a cumbersome procedure. I also don't really know why on the, the signaling in case of the serial decoder, for example, these line settings are like five different menu pages, but then on the trigger thing, it's all again in, in, in one menu page. So it seems all a little bit inconsistent. Um, also on the key side, we have to go through a couple of different menus, a little bit less than the, uh, than, than the signaling. Um, but I think this is more due to the control structure of that device. I mean, the, the, the key side simply does not have a touch screen and would not allow you really to combine these all on one, one single page. Um, whereas the, the, the signaling, I think, is not using the, the touch screen to the, to the full extent that it could. It really looks to me much more like an interface that was originally designed to have buttons to the side of the screen and then transferred to the touch screen and the buttons removed, but not really using uh, what could be the strength of a touch screen that you really get all the settings all, um, all together. The, the key side finally does automatically use all the line settings and threshold settings etc. also for the, uh, for the serial uh, trigger. So that's, uh, that's a good thing. Now I would like to focus a little bit more on 
on error messages and, and, and how we can retrieve them. And first looking at all the free devices at the, um, at the same time and still looking at the, uh, at the signal I was looking for for the, for the previous experiment, let me just deconnect the power of the receiving unit. Because what we should see then basically is that our oscilloscope see that the acknowledgement messages are actually starting to, to miss. So I'm going to remove the power and what's happening, yes, directly we see errors showing up. We see on the Roden and Swartz, we see non-acknowledgements here. We see on the signal, it's a bit harder to see perhaps, but the acknowledgements that were previously here with the yes, they, they disappeared here. And we see on the key side oscilloscope here that, that here we got errors at, uh, at well. Surprisingly, it shows it as form errors. I'm not completely sure because I think previously I have seen that these shows properly as non-acknowledgement errors. But right now I see on my device I got form errors being shown. So I might want to dig into that one time more. Let's now look at uh, serial decoding at the RTB in a little bit more detail. So we see now the, uh, the trace on channel A. We see some signals uh, coming in once in a while, every second basically. I already prepared the, um, the setup here. So I'm going to set up. I'm going to load a setup. Actually you see the little pictures of previously saved setup, how the screen looked like at that time. So that's the one over here. I'm loading it and then we should see our serial decoding coming up right now. Um, what I also like to do generally is to make sure that the horizontal reference is, is on the left so I make maximum use of my screen. So I do that by going to the horizontal setting. It's right here. I take the left reference point and I'm gonna Put my trigger right over here. This is an option that all these free oscilloscopes basically offer that you can choose your reference point in terms of where also the, um, the zooming, so if you change your time base comes from. I also like to use the maximum of the screen so that I basically can get the message all together. So I think these are nine messages that, that must be about it. Yeah, I'm getting to see my, my messages really well here. So let's quickly visit the, um, the, um, the setup menu here so we can see how that, that works on this device. So if I go to protocol configuration, I get to see the setup. There's not terribly much here um, for the COM protocol, uh, speed, regular type of things. We do have a fine threshold, so it can automatically determine the threshold level. That's rather convenient. And we do have a sample point, which is basically at what point, time point within a bit it's taking the sample, which is useful should you have a bit of noisy signals. Now, in terms of no talk of noisy signals, we got all the settings here, except one setting. That was a little bit surprising to me. There's one more setting that actually can be useful when you're doing serial decoding, and that one is not shown here. And to see that setting, you would actually go to the vertical channel here, you would go all the way down to the bottom and you would find a threshold. And there we got hysteresis, which you can change from small, medium to large. And why is that useful? This is particularly good if you're dealing with noisy signals and around of the time of the edges of your con signal, you might have trouble there. Um, it's a useful function. The other oscilloscopes don't have that, um, at least not a uh, adjustable uh, hysteresis, maybe they have a fixed one, but that, that is not documented as far as I could find in the, in the documentation. But that's a usual setting as well. Now let's return back here to the configuration. One more thing that I wanted to mention, you can of course choose between channels here. I choose channel one. What we cannot choose here, unfortunately, is a mathematics channel. Um, unfortunately, none of the free devices can do that. And why I'm stressing this, if you do things like with a differential protocol and you don't happen to have a differential probe around, then taking two channels to pick up the signals and just calculating the, uh, the bus signal would be, the, uh, would be the, uh, the logical thing to do. But the serial coders cannot accept that as an input. Um, I find that a bit of a disappointment. It's for all the free devices, I guess this is something that could be relatively easy added if, if they would like to, to do that. Now, I just talked about um, 
the um, the hysteresis and and so this is really about the question am I getting the right signal in and in that respect I would like to go and look at the signal a little bit closer so well this is not going to surprise you here we got the different messages coming uh, coming in here and we see that color coded we're going to see that on all the devices here the messages coming in what do we also see here we see a little bit pattern just above the message here and if there are multiple buses we see multiple bit patterns basically showing the same, the same thing as the um, as the lay bus as, as the trace here why this is super useful here you actually see whether the serial coder actually the, the the sample points are the one that you want so if you're dealing with noise or you're dealing with another situation where you might not be sampling enough points this is directly where you would see that happening so for example if you would change the uh, the acquisition speed because you want to put that into segmented memory um, this is very useful and also because not every oscilloscope is the same in implementation so some oscilloscopes take only one out of 10 sample acquisition points for the serial coder so you might not exactly be aware what's going on if you cannot see it and that is really nice of the RTB that we actually see the bit pattern here and you can confirm that the bit pattern actually looks like you would like it to look now we see now the messages are jumping a little bit from the one message to the uh, to the other of course because here I'm I'm triggering on something so what I'm actually triggering on let's let's go and see that my current trigger configuration I go to trigger I'm triggering of the start of a frame so any frame that could be we got a whole lot of triggering options the nice things that are shown here in the same screen so basically I could say here I want to trigger on the message with an identifier and if I recall well the identifier of my first message is 10 so I could choose hexadecimal 10 what's also nice that we got uh, it has a timeout here usually it doesn't bother me but to do the video it does bother me a little bit um, what we, we also have here is wildcards this is very flexible in terms of wildcards and I got it over all the menus where this is relevant so now I don't need these wildcards now I simply want to trigger on message number 10 and let me see if that did what I wanted to do yeah, every time now I'm triggering on this message 10 that's with start and the other messages actually got other IDs like 11 and 12 and, and, and otherwise in my, uh, in my little test. Okay, now often of course we want to look results in a, um, in a tabular type of form and of course all of the devices that we're looking at today uh, allow that possibility. So here that is called the bus table and I'm going to activate the bus table right now. It appears on the bottom of the screen and we can make it larger and actually it can get as large as, 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 as 20 lines which is a rather convenient thing that you can see everything at the same time so let me get back and, and get the whole message here the whole sequence of messages and we see here coming in exactly what we expected this is a bit like the bit pattern that I talked about the start message with ID 10 uh, the contest and the 500 kilobit message with, uh, with ID 11 we see here a message with an extended ID, the 20-bit ID here. We see here a message with hexadecimals. And note here that the device is currently set on, on ASCII, but any character that it doesn't recognize as a valid ASCII character is nicely shown as a hexadecimal character here. We see here a remote frame. Uh, so this is a, a request for a remote uh, frame from another device. And we got here the response to that remote frame. Actually, I don't know if you can still see it. I saw it a little bit earlier. The remote um, device actually sends at a slightly higher amplitude. So this is slightly higher, the two of them are here, than, than there. That, that is the, the, the physical setting and maybe some of the resistor settings that I have in, uh, in the configuration that I got here. So we see here uh, the various types of information that you otherwise would, would, would expect to see. We see some CRC, so, so, uh, so check, uh, checklists. Uh, check sums I should say and we see the status later on we're going to dig a little bit into the status what happened if we got errors here and we also see timing and this is timing relative to the uh, to the trigger point right now but we do have multiple options here um, if we go to bus table and we do differential timing then we can actually see the timing from one message relative to the other and this can be really useful if you want to to understand count messages going on uh, on the bus, the, the response time that devices have to respond to a remote message and, and, and order that type of, uh, of purposes. 
Okay, I'm not talking about all the options. We got track frame as well. That that can be interesting too. But I'm, um, yeah, that I'm 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 going to skip that right now for the for the interest of um, of time. Um, Overall, we, we, so we got a very nice and flexible display here of, of all the um, of table of all the, uh, all the messages. Um, is there nothing left to be desired? Well, well, yes. As you might notice here, if you look carefully at, at, at here, the strings moving and the update here, the update rate is pretty low. Um, I think it's about three updates a second or so. Um, I would like to see it much higher. Uh, and other devices got it much higher. So if anything, I would really like Roden and Swartz to update the refresh rate of the tablet view that they are offering here. Now, there's also a label option here that I would like quickly to show you and it's called label list. And what is this actually about? This is actually that we can load a set of labels associated with particular data here, like IDs. And that can be very useful if you use, for example, the CAN protocol and a certain ID number is used for the break and another ID number is used for a particular sensor and the other one is used for the wipers. And then you can make a very readable type of list here. I'm showing you an example right now on the screen where I uploaded a, a, a list. Actually, it's a different experiment. It's not the same signals that we're looking at right now. And finally here, on the Roden and Swartz, we also have a search function. So let's go there. Let's put this one a little bit down here. I'm going to go to search here. And this search function supports protocol. Actually, it's the only device here on the bench today that can do that. I can search protocol and then I can basically tell it to look at a particular thing going on. So I can say, look for the start of frames. And what I would see here is that the search parameters and the search screen here, I can switch between the messages screen and the search screen. I can see every time it is the end of a packet here. But I got a lot of more quite powerful search type of options. I can look for, for example, uh, let me take a little bit close look, apologies. I can look for example for only 29 bit frames and we got here there was 129 bit id here in my message and it's identifying that now i'm just seeing one here in the table but i would get all of them if there were multiple here in my in my screen and then there basically huh, this is about events huh, frame so that's an event like a frame starting or a particular type of frame um, you can look at particular errors so you can choose a combination of errors and then it will tell you whether that event is actually going on or not. I can look at particular identifiers that are coming by uh, 11 bits, 29 bits. I can look at a particular identifier in combination with particular data. And this again got wildcards here. So if I'm only interested in data, I'm keeping the wildcards here, which is the X, and I would define the data. And I would say, for example, I want something like two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, as much as eight, and I can do them as, as you see here, as, as, as bits, wildcard zero, one, or I can program as hexadecimal values, also got wildcards available here. And so we got a lot of options here, and, and actually I will be coming back to, uh, to this search function a little bit more when I'm gonna look at, um, at error messages, which I will deal separately with after we have seen this same experiment here on all three of our devices. Time to look at um, the Siglent and how it's decoding our signals. I have already set it up and you see here the signal that, that you've already seen in the previous part of the, the video. Here we can see a little better that the the first sender, the controller device, has a bit of a lower bit level than the uh, um, than the responding device that sends out the two last messages. These are just hardware things. We see, of course, the same thing on all four, all three of our oscilloscopes uh, today. Now, we see the general screen here. I again put the, the, uh, the horizontal reference over here so we can try to see at the full message. Um, so this whole thing takes like a, like a fraction of a second, um, but I cannot show it fully on, on the screen. And the reason is that the Siglent does not support 
um, a fine setting for the horizontal axis. I find it quite surprising. All the scopes, even the oldest analog oscilloscopes that I know of, um, got like a fine setting. And of course you got a fine setting on vertical, but not on horizontal. So you can even cho either choose something that goes way over the screen or it uses only half of the, 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 the screen here. Um, that is something that, that could be improved, I would, um, I would say. Now, going to the, uh, to the decoder settings, as I already have told you a little bit about like the, 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 the settings area all around. So if you have to go to the signals, you have to go to a menu, the protocol configuration, just one single thing, um, etc. I'm not going to repeat that. Um, that part here. Um, we cannot select a, a mass channel like the, the Roden and Swartz, like the key side. None of them can do that. Uh, as I already said, I think that is a little bit a, uh, is a, uh, is a miss. Um, let's focus now a, 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 a little bit on the signal that we are getting in um, and also looking at the, uh, the, the triggering of that, um, that signal. So I'm now putting this thing aside. As I already showed you before, the signal is very nice that it actually compresses the screen when you got a menu in and make it bigger again when the menu is, is out. I like that, uh, that option. Now let's go and look at the incoming signal here and I can tell you this is already uh, triggering now basically to the, um, um, to the beginning of, uh, of a frame. Um, so he should be picking up like any message. Um, strangely enough, he's not exactly doing that. Sometimes I see him going somewhere else, but as you see this weird flash here, sometimes he's somehow not picking up. Um, I have no idea what's going on here, because the strange thing, if I look at all of them at the same time, I see all these messages properly being decoded. But for some reason here, if I, if I go here, then this is, 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 is actually not not happening. He says some messages he's not picking up. It, it, it could be me. Maybe I'm doing something wrong in the setting. Maybe it's a user error here. Um, but I'm just noting it, it, it behaves a little bit different than I would expect it to behave, uh, to behave from here. Um, if you look at the precise messages, uh, they are of course what we expect, color coding like we find on, on other devices as, uh, as well. Um, we don't see the bit coding here that we actually see what goes into the, the decoder to, to, to verify uh, that as we just seen uh, before. Now let's go and look at the uh, at the bus table because that's the place where I usually go really to understand what signals I am um, I'm kind of dealing um, with. I thought we quickly lost something about the the signal. Sorry, maybe I've not put it back. Ah, there we there we are again. Oh, before we go to the bus setting, quickly uh, some of the, the the trigger settings. I think that's the the the, the right order to do it. So to do that. We need to go to the, the decode menu um, where you actually have the, 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 the protocol copy that I already mentioned. I, I think it was already there. Now we go to the, the trigger menu. We got the settings here. Um, we go to the trigger setting and here we got start, triggering on the remote frame, triggering on a particular ID. Um, so we can trigger on a various number of, uh, of things here. It's a bit less powerful, I would say. We got no wildcard support. Um, it's all a bit more basic. We can trigger on an error, but there's no indication what type of error or selection, what type of error is going to trigger us on. Um, so the trigger settings are a little bit more basic. Um, there's no error in this signal. So let me just get it out of the, uh, the error setting again. That was not a good idea. Um, yeah, now it's got this, uh, it's trigger back, uh, back working to the, um, to the table, uh, tabular, uh, display. Um, and again here I'm going to use um, ASCII view like I did on the other devices because I got an experiment that sends over several messages using, using ASCII. Um, and I can show it with the bus result. And I'm going to bus number one and we see the, the bus popping up here. It's at the bottom of the screen. The first thing we see here is that the bus is not so big. It is seven positions and actually it cannot get any bigger than seven. That's actually too short to show everything of the, the, the sequence of messages that I'm looking at today. So we need to go and scroll through so we can get to another point here. You can see that. Huh? But unfortunately, oh, not all the messages as, uh, at once. I would have, I would have preferred uh, that. If you look at the content of the messages is of course what we would more or less expect. We see the time. Um, you cannot do the relative timing. It's simply only the, the, um, 
the, the, the timing uh, in relation to the, to the trigger uh, signal. We see the type of message, standard or extended uh, address. Uh, we see the long extended address. We see the, uh, the ID, that's all what we expected. We see the messages in ASCII. However, the hexadecimal messages are not properly um, showing up here. He tries to show it as illegal ASCII characters. Um, in this case, it's little boxes. I've also seen cases where you got this strange uh, question mark in a diamond in, uh, shown in reverse. Um, I would really prefer if, if the ASCII character is, is an illegal or not a regular type of, uh, of printable ASCII character, that he would instead show the, um, the hexadecimal. That would be much more, uh, more useful, like the, the, the roadness was this. But he's just showing the, uh, the other character here. Um, and we can go down here to the message. Let's see if I can see more or less what I want to show at the same time. Yeah, we got the, the, the return request here coming in and we got the response messages. So otherwise this is what we expect. We see the, the, the CRC code. Um, and later I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about some specifics about the CRC code that's uh, showing here. And we got the positive acknowledgements uh, coming in. So if I would take away acknowledgements in my, my test signal, um, this would disappear. Uh, I can actually show it. I mean, I'll just pull out the plug here of the receiver. And yeah, so oh, it says for a moment no acknowledgements. Now they're gone altogether. But um, yeah, we see what happened. It's still decoding, but we have no acknowledgement. I'm going to put back in the receiver and I hope the acknowledgements are soon coming back when my, my Arduino started again. Oh yes, my Arduino is up and, um, up and running again. Um, I think that's about it. We, have, um, we don't have this label thing where we can assign text labels to particular things, uh, to particular values or, or uh, to, to, to IDs. Um, there is not a search function here. Well, the oscilloscope got a search function for sure, um, but it cannot do anything related to a serial protocol or, or decode it. So it's just limited what, what we, we get to see right, uh, right here. Now, I think that is as far as I wanted to show you about the uh, the support that is offered, functional support that is offered by the, uh, by the Siglent device. How is our Keysi doing in terms of serial decoding? Now, let's take a close look. Of course, we're going to look with the uh, same signals as before. And I've already configured the device and we see the same pattern as we see a couple of times before here being shown on the uh, on the screen. Of course we got a totally different type of interface, you have to get used to it and you may or may not like it or know it from the past, but we have to go to analyze, we have to create a serial bus, we have to go to come and then we can look at the signals. Some of the nice things that we have here is that you can choose a sample point like in the R2B, uh, but the Cyclin doesn't have that. There's a quite flexible setting here of uh, polarity of the, uh, the CAN bus, also in terms of, of relevance to the, uh, to the differential bus uh, features. Um, the Siglent does not allow us, like the other two, to select a, a mass channel, uh, for reasons that I mentioned before. Um, that's a bit of a miss, I think. No hysteresis setting. Um, and if we actually go and look a little bit more at a smaller signal and you see that I put a reference point already here on the left. Uh, we, um, we do not have the, the logic bits that we're seeing here. Now focusing here on the, um, on the first packet we see he's nicely picking up all the different messages here. Um, is he? Yeah, let's see. Actually I'm not exactly sure what the current trigger setting is. I'll need to take a closer look at that. Actually, the device not triggering at all, so I, I might have made a little uh, mistake here. Let's go to trigger. Let the video maar even draaien. Now, here. now let's go and, uh, and look at a single frame here. Like with the other scopes, I set the um, 
I set the reference point here to the, to the left of the, the screen. We're nicely seeing that it's triggering each time. Trigger right now is set on a, on a single uh, package here uh, or the start of, of a packet. Um, we don't get the bit pattern as we've seen on the, uh, the Roden and, um, and, and, and Swartz. Now let's go and take a look at, um, at triggering because as we can see now it's triggering on all types of different messages uh, here. So let's see what triggering options we have that we always go and see the first message. Um, triggering here set a com. Oh yeah, one thing, we, we have a trigger hold off time. Um, also the Roden and Swartz has that. Um, I think I didn't mention it. The Siegland is, is lacking that. It, it can be super handy if you need to trigger on certain messages but you haven't quite got there yet via the, the, the serial triggering and, and hold off can really help you to easily get to, to a new string of, of messages. So it's there. Um, so um, we're going to take a look at the, uh, the, the, the trigger type. The trigger type is set on con and we got a quite powerful set of, uh, of choices uh, here. So now we're starting here on the starter frame or remote frame, a couple of older things. We can choose um, also, uh, specific types of error, we can error frames, we can get all errors, acknowledgement errors, overload frames, so it's, it's fairly flexible there. And also this device basically allows us to select, um, and, and, and let, let me just quickly see if I can show you to it here. Yeah, we see it here at the bottom, it's a bit cryptic, but actually the interface works quite well if you work with it. Um, you can select uh, message IDs, uh, but also data, by the way, and it does support a uh, wildcard, so that makes it quite, uh, quite flexible. So in this case, if I want to, uh, to just uh, for, uh, trigger on a particular message, I would choose here that, that, that message, I would go here, and actually you can set it via this interface, um, up and then to the one on the right. Actually, it, it, it works quite well once you actually get used to it. You just don't look at the display things. So I can tell them how we're here to, so we'll actually triggering now matches number two, now we're triggering 12, matches 13, matches 14, and we're going back to the start message, which is triggering on, on message number uh, 10. There we go. Uh, so the triggering part is, um, is working quite well and it's, it's, it's quite extensive. Uh, more extensive than the Sigland, not as, ex as extensive as the Art and BOS uh, is here. Now we're going to move to the... Um, to the bus uh, display. I'm going to put back my, uh, my, my trigger simply at, um, I think I already lost the trigger settings. Go back there for one second. I'm going to trigger back to the, uh, to the starter frame um, setting. I'm going to see again like a whole string of messages. Uh, we, uh, we are properly triggered as we can see over here. And we're going to look at the, um, at the table view with all the, uh, all the messages. We go to analyze and the table view is over here and we get the table here. Um, first thing that we see, well we don't really see it right now, you need a much faster signal to see it really well, but the update rate of, the, um, uh, of this is very high. Um, I made a note somewhere, um, I'm not even sure if I know it um, on the top of my head, yeah about, about 25 a second, uh, 20, 25 frames a second, so it's super fast in updating. Well my messages are not changing that fast, but uh, but that's a, nice, uh, that's a nice feature. We got nine lines. That's a bit more than a signal, but still not as much I would, I would, I would like to see. We, we cannot see here all the messages at once. And we have the limitation that we can scroll only when we pause acquisition. So right now I cannot look at the, the later messages. Only if I stop acquisition, I, get, uh, I can show that. I stop acquisition, then I get a scroll up a possibility. Of course, I, I, I just happened to cross this. So, ah, that's a longer message. Um, I go to the scroll and now I can scroll through the messages. Yeah? Um, so that's a bit more, um, more limited in display. What do we get to see? Well, that, that's kind of the same thing we saw before. This is all predictable. Huh? We got the IDs, we got the, the length of the packages, the data. The key site cannot show ASCII data at all, at least in the CAN setting. It can for some other protocols, but not for CAN. So we have no way of seeing the direct text of it. Uh, we do see here the, uh, the hexadecimal codes that were part of our testing, 10, 11, 12 uh, that we had here. And if I put it back on run, uh, we do see here uh, this number going on right here where I got my pencil, 39. And now it starts again, 30, 
31, 32. Um, that, that is actually a counter in, in ASCII, uh, the ASCII number that is shown there. Um, so, so 30 is actually a zero and 31 is, uh, is, is, is one, I think, and ASCII and 32 is two. Uh, um, yeah, so um, that, that, that works uh, pretty well. We got a couple of more options here in the, in the lister and one of them is also that we have different time references. So we can have a time reference to the previous message that we had or we can have a time reference to the trigger signal. We got track time, that was a feature that we already saw with the RTB. And track time basically means that if you put the message to um, a hold, let, let's just see if we, uh, if we got here, we got a number of, of messages here. I should be able with the scroller to go through here. Let's, let's indicate track time, let's turn here. And then you will see actually the display will scroll along to the particular, the ray will scroll along to the particular message that's being shown. Well, this is not part of that, that this acquisition right now. Uh, especially useful when your messages are, are, are really spaced very far apart, a useful type of, uh, of functionality. Um, yeah, um, one final thing here about the tabular um, display is that unfortunately every time that you leave the tabular display mode uh, menu it, it, it goes away. So we are here but every time we want to see the list we have to go here and we cannot be in any other menu right now. Um, so that's that's kind of slightly in, um, inconvenient. I wish that the lister stayed on all the time that we wanted it uh, to be. Now we're almost finished with looking at this part of the experiment to the key side, but one last thing that I would like to show um, and that we haven't seen on any other devices yet and it's down here at the bottom. It got a totalizer and it's telling us the number of frames that came by in our experiment and we can reset it with the button over here. We can see the number of overload frames, the number of error frames. We can see the load on the bus, we can see percentages of errors. So this is a very useful feature that shows something about the, the, the quality of the communications going on at the, uh, at the buses. Uh, that's unique only for the, the key side that we have here. Um, finally, we got no labels we can attach uh, to particular message types, etc. Manually attach. Um, and there's no search function on the, uh, on the serial decoder either. The last topic where I would like to look at when it comes to serial decoding is uh, the way that these devices uh, deal with errors on the bus. Um, and for this actually I'm going to change to another test signal because the test signal we used before uh, for the CAN bus actually didn't have any errors in it. You could try to create some errors in the divide by, by choosing not the right decode uh, bout rate uh, or, or peek around a little bit with, uh, with levels perhaps. Um, but we got a much better way to do it. And actually it's inside the key site. It's a feature that I really like of this device. It can create training signals coming out from his, uh, his demo and his, uh, his probe uh, compensation uh, signal. Um, and of course the demos are not unique, the Roden and Swartz uh, can make a lot of different demos as well. The, 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 the signal, by the way, doesn't make any demos at all. But what is interesting about the demos here, let's, let's go there. We go to, um, and I think I took the, the wrong menu, uh, training signals. Yeah, and training signals, I see here a bunch of training signals. We got sine waves, we got modulation, glitches, bursts, blah, blah, blah. And we got here a CAN signal. And we're gonna select that, gonna turn it on. And what is so interesting about this training signal it got errors inserted at semi-random positions for testing purposes. Um, what we also see here, how terribly fast the key side is with, with decoding. Um, this is really the, the, the key side in a way. I mean, it's a much different instrument from the others. It may not be as capable at, at, at many different things uh, in terms of, uh, of its software and functionality. But the things that it does looking at waveforms and this kind of decodes is super, super fast. We'll also see that if we go to his lister, if I would quickly go there, uh, let's have the list run. Yeah, you see, this, this is a super, super fast. And you might already see quickly here, sometimes there's a red thing. I just saw it, saw it showing up. There was actually an error in the signal, but we're gonna focus on that in, in greater detail in a moment. Let's go and take a look at the, um, at the other oscilloscopes uh, here and how they deal with this signal. And quickly comparing here the update rate of the devices, we just saw the key site super fast in the updates of the, the telegram information. The Roden and Swartz is also really super, super fast doing that. 
It's just that the tabular view is slow and that's, that's too bad because it's actually super fast. We see that the Sigland is a bit lagging, lagging behind here. It doesn't really take all the messages out as quickly as the other ones really, uh, really do here today. Now, looking in detail at the um, error messages on the, the Roden and Swartz, huh? we see the decode going on a little bit bigger. Huh? You can see it's, uh, it's very, very fast. Um, so if we want to see error messages, at first we're probably going to turn to the, uh, to the protocol settings and, and take a look at the bus table and see the error messages coming in over there. Now, the bus table, as we know, is not terribly fast. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to actually take a look at a lot of messages. And we see CRC error, stuff bit error. Um, let's see if some other errors, a data error. So we certainly do see errors coming by. Now, the thing is that these errors are quite sparse in this particular test signals. There are many less errors than good packages and they come kind of in a quasi random pattern here. Uh, so not always in the, 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 the same point in the sequence of messages that are coming in here. But now comes in a feat, uh, powerful feature of the Roden and Swartz. We can use the search function, which I showed already, works on protocol. So we go to the search function, we go to protocol. So it takes all the settings of the CON protocol. We go to the setup function. We ask him to check out for errors and we're going to tell him, select here all these four different error types. And I'm going to go to back here and I'm going to make the screen a little bit bigger even. And right here we see all the errors being shown here. And there can also be multiple errors. We're not seeing that right now, I think. Um, but I did quite a bit of testing before and this device can also show multiple errors that occur on packages. And you see here on the top here, these, these little orange triangles here, these are the results of the search function and we exactly see how many errors are occurring and where these errors errors are in the search uh, in in the signal so both in terms of the tabular view but also in terms of the possibility here to look in the um, in the um, in the search function we can easily find the errors on top of it we can also trigger the scope on um, on errors. Um, I'm not going to go there now, but that is certainly possible as well. Turning now to the Sigland, looking at the same signal and we're going to try to see if we can look up the errors. And I have to tell you, this is where my biggest deception with the device comes in up to now. We don't get to see errors. We get to see decoded signals, um, but we don't get any error messages and we did quite a lot of testing and the thing is that there is simply not even a table here for error messages. We do get to see the acknowledgement um, for most of the other protocols here and that's the SPY protocol and, and UART etc. Um, there, there's, there's simply no messages at all. Please look at the background document for information but, but uh, except for one or two other protocols the Sigland is not able to show any error messages either in the telegram or in the bus display when errors are going on. And I even found out, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but if you feed him with error signals, for example an inverted bus, which are clearly not properly proper signals, bus uh, signals, he just decodes these signals and, and presents them as if they were correct signals. And that's a bit worrying to me that, that you don't have an ID when he's actually showing proper uh, messages or whether he's showing messages that are actually garbage that have like the, the wrong ID, the wrong packet length, the wrong payload, but you have no ID because he's kind of just showing it up. Um, by the way, we see the decode running now. Now it goes a little bit faster. So it depends a little bit here on, the, uh, on how, how large you make the, the message on the screen, it, uh, it seems. And before we were having that he was not updating the messages that, that fast, I think. Yeah. Yeah, if you make the message bigger, then, then you just have to show one decoded message on the line. So we, we get to see that. Um, there's no search function, so we can't get there to get to message to, to errors uh, either. So if you need to find out about errors, basically the only thing you can do is go to the trigger menu, um, go trigger settings and have the device basically 
triggering on error signals. So now I've got to change the time base a little bit. And we got successful triggering going on here. So the thing is that, and, and that I really find a weird thing. So the signal knows there are errors. I can trigger on them. I just don't get to see them. And that is the, the difficulty really I think here. And I don't see what type of, of error is, is, taking, uh, is taking place uh, here. So altogether this, this looking into errors on, on the signal creates a very complex type of situation. It's a little bit different per protocol. Um, with some of the other protocol triggers you can look into different type of errors but strangely enough you first must know the ID and the, the payload of the first two byte of the particular message before you can detect if it has an error. And that's kind of world turned around. I mean often in advance I don't know the characteristics of the packet huh? a priori where the error is gonna, gonna take place. So um, yeah for me the signal scores very low on this aspect. I just cannot be sure whether the outcomes that are being shown on this device uh, are actually correct or not. And I think this is the first thing that, that Sigland, if anything on a new firmware update, would have to fix. Show proper errors, make an error column in each of the protocols and show that errors are taking place. Because the device knows it, I can know it from playing around with the trigger settings that he's able to trigger on these errors, but he's just not showing them when you're working on the device. Huh? A major minus I would say. Turning now to the signal, looking at the same signal and we're going to try to see if we can look up the errors. And I have to tell you this is where my biggest deception with the device comes in up to now. We don't get to see errors. We get to see decoded signals, um, but we don't get any error messages. And we did quite a lot of testing and the thing is that there is simply not even a table here for error messages. We do get to see the acknowledgement um, for most of the other protocols here and that's the SPY protocol and, and UART etc. Um, there, there's, there's simply no messages at all. Please look at the background document for information but, but uh, except for one or two other protocols the signal is not able to show any error messages either in the telegram or in the bus display when errors are going on. And I even found out, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but if you feed him with error signals, for example an inverted bus, which are clearly not properly proper signals, bus uh, signals, he just decodes these signals and, and presents them as if they were correct signals. And that's a bit worrying to me, that, that you don't have an ID when he's actually showing proper uh, messages, or whether he's showing messages that are actually garbage, that have like the, the wrong ID, the wrong packet length, the wrong payload, but you have no ID because he's kind of just showing it up. Um, by the way, we see the decode running now, now it goes a little bit faster, so it depends a little bit here on, the, uh, on how, how large you make the, the message on the screen, it, uh, it seems. And before we were having that he was not updating the messages that, that fast, I think. Yeah. Yeah, if you make the message bigger, then, then you just have to show one decoded message on the line, so we, we get to see that. Um, there's no search function, so we can't get there to get to, message, to, to errors uh, either. So if you need to find out about errors, basically the only thing you can do is go to the trigger menu, um, go trigger settings, and have the device basically triggering on error signals. So now I've got to change the time base a little bit. And we got successful triggering going on here. So the thing is that, and, and that I really find a weird thing, so the signal knows there are errors. I can trigger on them, I just don't get to see them. And that is the, the difficulty really I think here, and I don't see what type of, of error is, is, taking, uh, is taking place uh, here. So altogether this this looking into errors on, on the signal creates a very complex type of situation. It's a little bit different per protocol. Um, with some of the other protocol triggers you can look into different type of errors, but strangely enough you first must know the ID and the, the payload of the first two byte of the particular message before you can detect if it has an error. And that's kind of world turned around. I mean often in advance I don't know the characteristics of the packet a priori where the error is gonna, gonna take place. So um, yeah, for me the signal scores 
very low on this aspect. I just cannot be sure whether the outcomes that are being shown on this device uh, are actually correct or not. And I think this is the first thing that, that Sigland, if anything on a new firmware update, would have to fix. Show proper errors, make an error column in each of the protocols and show that errors are taking place. Because the device knows it, I can know it from playing around with the trigger settings that he's able to trigger on these errors, but he's just not showing them when you're working on the device. Huh? A major minus, I would say. Now, finally, also looking at the, uh, the key side, how it does deal with, uh, with errors in the, um, in the messages. Here again, we're looking at the same stream of information. And the first place where I, of course, would turn to to try to see errors is looking at the, uh, the tabular view. We go there and... I might want to make it a bit... Yeah, if you can see it, it goes very fast because the update rate is incredibly high. But you might have noticed a number of red messages coming in here. Yeah, okay, this is... I see form errors, sometimes I see two errors here with a comma in between. I don't know if you can see it as quickly as I can, but certainly the device is, 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 is finding a variety of different errors here that is shown in a special column here, like the Roden and Swartz uh, does, um, a special column showing uh, errors. If I want to know a little bit better, you know, what type of error uh, occur, then of course I will try to trigger on, on error settings. The table is disappearing as, as we already observed before, I would go to, uh, to trigger type. Of course, it has to be a normal. I'll tell the device to basically trigger here on any type of error. And I will go back to my list setting here. And what we see now, have we see it here at the bottom? Let's make it a little bit bigger. Now we're only triggering on error. So every time the trigger uh, sets in, that is when an error is there. And yes, we see form error. We see a number of different error settings we can... Uh, I, I don't know all the abbreviation actually by, um, uh, by heart uh, because if, if there are two of them that are shown with commas in a short form and otherwise they're written longer, but they're all nicely documented in the manual. So the key site in fact can you know, perfectly pick out the errors. It's all well documented in its, uh, in its manual as well. With all these serial buses around us nowadays, we are almost forgetting that these devices here are also quite capable of decoding um, parallel uh, digital buses. So we're going to take a quick look at that at the end of this uh, video. And in order to test this, I will be using a little test board of, uh, of Rigel and it creates a number of, of signals, including a number of parallel buses. So as you might see here, I've connected one bus here. This actually go to the RTB. The other one is connected to the, um, to the signal. It's actually quite nice. I don't know if coincidence or not, but the signal connector actually goes right away into the, uh, into the edge that, the, um, that this little board um, here has. So actually the RTB is going to get the fast bus signals and the signal here is going to get the, the slower bus signals because this is one single 16-bit bus and I'll just be using eight bits per device for the time being that does enough basically for the For the test of today. So let's go back here and zoom back into the device that we want to take a look at Now in order to decode these serial buses, of course, we'll be using the digital channels here so let me activate the digital channels here and i've taken here eight digital channels on the rtb and of course we could also use all 16 if we wish to and it's quite flexible we can put them all around the screen where we want them we can make like this bigger and small it's quite flexible you can also move them around all of them individually you actually get a quite a nice interface if you do that do i get to that interface yeah, and then I can select if I want to move all of them or just a single one. Okay, but we're going to leave it for now as it is and we're going to leave the, the bus up here. And let's go take a look then at these decode options that we would like to investigate here. Now, the decode options here are like the serial protocols under the protocol thing, huh? so the parallel protocol. So we got parallel protocols and we can define the number of bits that we have here and we also can flexibly rearrange the 
the bits to the protocol in the way that we wish to, uh, to do so and, and the bus width um, and some of the threshold levels etc. If we go back here then we will see that actually there's also a parallel clocked option and let's look at its configuration and it actually means that we have a parallel bus which also has a chip select and a clock and you can also made it in a way that you only have a clock and not a, a chip select. So, so that, that is a rather powerful um, option. Um, one thing that I find slightly regrettable is that why we can't use um, analog channels for the chip select and the clock and then we actually would maintain a full 16-bit uh, clocked bus but that's not the way it's implemented here. Might happen in some, some firmware update, no idea about that. Um, Anyway, today we're going to look at a, uh, yeah, so here the chip select, if you have it, then, then there will be one bit uh, more or less uh, at that interface. So now I'm going to look at the parallel bus that we got right here, because the bus is not, uh, is not clocked, and we're going to look at uh, the decode options here. Well, let's go to... Uh, take a look at the, the screen. So here actually on the bottom we already see the, the decode screen being shown here. I can move it around on the, on the screen and I'm showing the values here at hexadecimal, right? So one of the things that is quite nice about this that we can also change the size of this. And this is actually very useful at the moment that we want to see a lot of values at the same time. So here we can actually get to see I think as many as 48 bus values at the same time. And this gets even more interesting in a way if I'm switching here the display type to binary. If I would like to see the, uh, the binary bus content here. Let's go there. Binary. Back. And, and also in this binary view of course we, we, we can have a binary view where things are, are kind of shown next to each other obviously uh, but in the binary view we can also choose to make it like very small and then we just increase the height of the bus and look at that my bus is a little bit jumping around it's a very fast signal so i haven't perhaps locked it entirely yet uh, but again we can see 48 bus values here basically at the same time being shown in the, uh, in the interface, which makes it rather powerful. Using this interface, and I'll switch for one moment here back to the, um, to the hexadecimal setting here. In a similar fashion as before, we can use many of the options of the, um, uh, of the decode that we saw earlier um, today. So we can go to uh, the bus table, we can have a bus table being shown here, and oh here we have the data actually in in in, um, in hexadecimal uh, we can again do the time differences and like all the things we we saw before all these options are also available here now let's look how that is implemented on the siglent so also here we'll have to activate our digital channels we get to see all 16 digital channels and the associated menu. Now let's just select the eight channels that we're interested. We go here, we have here an interface that allows us to do that. And also here we can dynamically rearrange the bus settings towards the, the logical uh, pins on the, um, on the bus. So we can basically be moving them uh, around if, if necessary, if they're just in the reverse order, for example. So I'm gonna stay with this particular bus. I would like to make it a little bit smaller to make some room for the, uh, for the display. I cannot do that with the regular controls here. They allow me to select a certain bit on the bus. Both of the controls actually do the same thing. I think the only way to do it is actually to go to the menu over here and then just very often press that button here. I think I might be able to do it with the same controller here. Yes. Okay, here we go. We get the bus a little bit smaller and the position can also be controlled for here, but it doesn't go really in the same way as this works in the, in the other menu. Now, let us go and, and, and decode that bus. It doesn't happen via the, the decode setting, but you actually stay in the digital channel 
section and there is a part called uh, called bus i already set the, uh, the the levels right as i did actually on the on the rodent and swords and and here we can choose our basic decode characteristics so we can see set that we want to see the values in hexadecimal we can choose the bit size that is quite fine here the data here Oh, actually, it's here that you actually reconfigure the, um, the, the, the bus uh, part here, um, not on the previous screen. I was wrong about, uh, about that. Um, and we can have the bus position the moment we see where it's going. So let's turn the display on. And yeah, it, uh, it works. We see the, um, the hexadecimal values here showing up for all the, the values of, in this case, this 8-bit uh, this uh, bus. And of course, here we can also go to hexi or to, to, to binary view huh? that will be a quite common view one thing that we're running into here quite easily is the room to be able to see all these bits here because we're going to need quite a bit of room basically to be able to uh, to see such a display and unfortunately the height of the display cannot be controlled so this is as much as we can get in um, in values here basically so um, I don't think we can get to see more than, if we're looking at the 16-bit values, five values here uh, uh, versus 14 for the RTMB. And for, for any other settings, I think, and, and we can go to, uh, to hexadecimal to see a bit more about that. Um, that's bus and that's hexadecimal. And let's change the time scale. Yeah, no, we cannot see this anymore. We, we can see this. So at maximum, we can do 19 uh, values uh, within a single screen, uh, whereas the Rodin and Swartz goes all the way up to 48 at the same time. So altogether, both of these bus decodes uh, work fairly well, um, but the Siglent is more limited in terms of types of bus, cannot do clocked bus, etc. And it's a bit more limited in the the display option that simply take more room, so it's harder really to see uh, a lot of different bus values at the, uh, at the same time. And then our key side, and I was pretty sure you thought we don't need to talk about this because this scope actually doesn't have digital channels. So what do we want to do in terms of parallel bus decode? But actually there is a little bus decode function here, which I'll quickly show you. So I just configured four channels that come into the analog channels. And then if we go to the analyze menu, there is an item which is actually called the analog bus. And there we go. We activate the analog bus for analysis. We need to assign channels for it. So I'm just assigning 1 to 1, 2 to 2, 3 to 3, 4 to 4. And we can select a base on which we would like to see the data. And well, you already see the data down in the, um, in the picture already. We can decode serial or parallel buses at least if they're on at maximum 4 bits, uh, bits wide. Uh, and we, we see nicely the bit order here at the, uh, at the bottom. I mean, of course, this is very limited compared to the other two devices we were just looking at. But it, it, it does work. Huh? Uh, they, they made nice use of the, uh, of the fact they still got four channels and you can do something like that. The first time I tried to use it was very confused. I didn't get it to work until I found that out that actually um, the threshold is separately to be set for each of the channels. So you have to revisit each of these channels here and then you have to choose a threshold value that is somewhere within range and otherwise you get these errors that you see coming on the screen right uh, right now but the moment you find out that you have to set these separate threshold levels by the way my signal is not 35 volts but i'm using a 10 times probe so it's 3.5 volts so it's picking up a ttl signal so also our our key site can do a little bit of parallel bus decoding So, is there any clear conclusion that we can draw today? Um, yes, I think so. The Roden and Swartz is clearly the most capable device for serial decoding here today, followed by the, uh, the key side. And unfortunately, the Sigland is not able to catch up to these other devices in, in terms of this particular job. 
Having that said, this is not the final episode of this series and I can already give you a spoiler that there will be new episodes coming up where actually the, the cars are going to be reversed and where the Siglent actually has a stronger implementation than the other two devices. So stay tuned.